Hi, I'm Dr. Mike Milligan. I'm here with Dr. Roy Shelburne of Virginia. Roy, thanks so much for being with us. Pleasure to be with you. Thanks. Yeah, Appreciate it. You bet. Now, this is a, it's a, something that could happen to any one of us. It's very important. We're going to talk about documentation in the chart and uh, coding and things of that nature. But anyway, Roy, why don't you tell us a little bit about what happened to you and then we'll talk about how we can prevent it. This is something the dentist, the staff, everyone involved ought to hear. Thank you. Um, I spent 19 months in federal prison for healthcare fraud as a result of a complaint that was made to the, um, it was the Western District of Virginia, the Medicaid Fraud Division. Um, there was an investigation that was initiated and I was uh, a target of that investigation. After three years um, and a great deal of, of torment. I was indicted, was um, spent some time um, preparing for that trial and then about a year and a half later went to, went to trial. Um, did not feel comfortable pleading guilty to anything because I didn't feel I was, a, I was guilty of anything that would warrant um, prison time. Um, so at the end of that nine day trial I was found guilty by a jury of healthcare fraud, or I was also charged with racketeering and money laundering. Uh, as a result of those charges, I was sentenced to uh, 24 months in federal prison, and I spent 19 months in federal prison and two and a half months in a halfway house. And during the process, I was able to understand what it took to be able to put together a record that would basically testify for you when you're not able to speak for yourself. I was also able to see the importance of billing and coding and what that will do um, in the event that you aren't careful about making sure that you're doing it properly. Right. And every, 100 percent of dentists could, this could happen to them. The, the, just the things we do in our office, the record keeping, you cannot be perfect enough, but there are things that you can do, and we're going to talk about Absolutely. that, to lessen the chance to head this off. And um, if they come in up front and you've got good records and, and good documentation, we're going to go over what that means, mm -hmm. then maybe they will let you <laughs> go. So yeah. tell us some of the things that you've learned that, that the staff and we need to know about to prevent this from occurring to us or try to help prevent sure. it. Sure. Um, there was one instance in particular, in, in Virginia, any major treatment that we provided had to be approved prior to. So the question was, uh, treatment that I provide for a, for a patient, it was a, a restorative treatment. Um, their expert witness had reviewed and had indicated that the chart did not indicate the need for that treatment, didn't support the need for the treatment. Okay. So my attorney, during the, the trial I was testifying, he asked me, Dr. Shelburne, what do you typically do to be able to determine a restorative a restoration is necessary? And I went through the litany um, observation. We use an explorer. X-rays also help to determine. And went through the list um, and finished with, with that particular patient and that description. Went through the whole um, testimony with my attorney. And then it was the prosecution's time um, to be able to have at me. Um, I was asked, Dr. Shelburne, is this the patient we had discussed prior to? And I said, yes, it is. And he said, um, you did a very nice job of being able to describe what you do to be able to justify treatment necessary for that patient. And then he put a, a blow up um, on the AV of that chart of, the, of that patient for that particular diagnosis and treatment plan as well as the treatment for that day. And he turned to me and he asked, Dr. Shelburne, can you tell me from all those things that you described that you typically do to be able to justify that treatment that you recorded that you did any of those things. And I had to look at my chart and turn back to him and said, I didn't record any of that. And he turned very dramatically to the jury and said, well, now I guess we just need to take your word for it, don't we? So if it's not in your chart, from a legal standpoint, you didn't say it, you didn't do it, it didn't need to be done, it, it doesn't exist from the legal standpoint. So um, my recommendation is to make sure that you document the need for the treatment in a way that a third party observer could look and say, yes, this is what the doctor used to be able to determine that that treatment was necessary. Now, just a couple of things. Number one, this was like, eighteen thousand dollars out of three and a half million over a three-year period that was uh, con 
uh, called a problem here. Correct. The jury actually doesn't determine the amount of, of restitution, the amount that you've been overpaid. They determine whether or not you're guilty of health care fraud. Right. And the truth is, did we bill inappropriately? Were we paid for things that we weren't entitled to? Absolutely. We were also able to establish while we reviewed that there were things that we could have billed for and been paid for that was actually in excess of the amount that we were paid that we were not They're entitled to. But that doesn't make any difference. Right. Um, the, tr the truth is that I was paid for something that was we weren't entitled to. Were the, were the errors intentional from my definition of intent? Absolutely not. From the legal standpoint, intent is defined by either knew or reasonably should have known that what was being done was being done correctly or incorrectly. And is there a expectation from the, the public that you do do it right? Yes. Whether it has to be at a level that's perfection, you know, that's debatable. But it was, it was $17,899.57 of an overall payment of about $3.5 million that I was found that I got that I was not entitled to. Well, okay, so it can happen to any of us. It's de absolutely devastating to your life. Um, and so we can't document like the government does. I mean, you look at some of these government papers and it would take us a year to write that for an occlusal filling. Sure. What can we do within a reasonable amount of time mm -hmm. to document in the chart that, that will help, help, help us get through this? You know, as far as things are improving, as far as the electronic record, I'm familiar with some um, software companies that actually have an outline on the right-hand side of specific criterion that would contribute to the, the possible carriagenicity that that person carries. Okay. And if you, you have the, the template on the left-hand side, you can actually just drag that information, it's bang, 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 and it goes into it, so it's very okay. simply. Writing it down, of course, is more problematic. You have to be careful right. about what you put in there, but right. you know, I, I tell people it only matters when it matters, and I can tell you that had I spent more time prior to, I wouldn't have spent 19 months in federal prison or right. feel that that chance would have been much, much right. less. Right. So, so how much do we write? I mean, uh, we talk about SOAR, uh, subjective, the object, go. SOAP. A um, excuse me. Subjective SOAP. is um, what the patient shares with you about whatever okay. their condition is. The objective is what we observe, and that's where you would, you would list anything that contributed to your decision to be able to provide that treatment. It doesn't have to necessarily include everything, but the, right. the major things that you observe that would, as you as a clinician would put off the, the bulb in your head that said, yes, we need to treat it this way. Right. And uh, especially in the event, we've all had situations where we've started a procedure and it ended up being nothing like we anticipated. Sure. So Absolutely. we, we of course, if we're surprised, anybody that reviews that after we are, are very surprised. That, right. that goes with the insurance right. company or anybody right. that reviews that. So especially if if the information that you started out with that led you down one path is absolutely wrong and you should have gone down another path, those are right. the ones that you especially need to be careful about because if document. it surprised you, it's going to surprise anybody else. Document what, what happened okay. and, and what changed so that you, you change, had to change path in that treatment procedure. Okay. And I know Rose Nierman with Dental Rider, mm -hmm. they talk about the SOAP method. Sure. We've got sure. that in our office. Um, but short of that, just do your best to get those things written up. Yeah. and. Anything yeah. pertinent, yeah. Now what about in, informed consent? Yeah. Talk to me about that. Um, I recommend that anything that is non-reversible, that you have an informed consent. Right. So that's about associated billing, with uh, anything non-reversible. Yeah. Okay. Um, the best source of those documents, as far as templates to be able to use, would be your malpractice carrier, right. because they have to partner with you in the event that there's a question, as far as malpractice question or something right. like that. So, right. they have a legal team that is more than likely produced the documents. So, if you you contact your malpractice carrier, they can produce those documents and the recommendations as far as informed consent. Should be able to. And I said, is there a dental company that has all this? He says, I don't think any dental company would want want to risk the liability of no, doing this. No, and that makes sense. Absolutely. So go to your practice mm -hmm. carrier and if they don't have it maybe they can guide you to to, to the appropriate place I'm not aware of a, a malpractice carrier that cannot <laughs> provide you with okay. that information okay what else should we talk about you you, you do lectures seminars on this mm -hmm. type of thing you speak all, around the country now sure we um, 
As far as billing and coding, I think is extremely important. Um, you need to make sure that your staff is well trained and that they're current, right. because the interpretation of those codes and their applicability changes. Right. So um, be careful to train that individual. We as doctors sometimes fail in our responsibility to train those people to be able to right. do that appropriately. You put somebody in that position and they kind of work through it, kind of hit and miss sure. the best they can. Learn it the best they can. But I would invest in as many helps as you possibly can to be able to yeah. give them the tools that they need to make the proper um, selections coding. when coding. Selections. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, now, sir. One of the best things out there that I'm aware of is Dr. Charles Blair mm -hmm. and his coding with confidence. Sure. You, you get a book or you can get the mm -hmm. online version. Sure. It's phenomenal what yeah. he does. He, um, he has the Coding with Confidence book, which is a paper book. He has the Insurance Solutions newsletter, and then he has, right. has the new Practice Booster website, which combines yeah. both those, and it also puts the information in a word-driven document so that you don't need to know what the code is. If you know a couple of words that are associated with that procedure, then you can search by that word, and it'll give you all the options and all the, the procedures that are associated with that particular term. You, you highlight the, the number and it will give you the ADA code so that you have that automatically. And as you, you kind of scroll through, if there's a code that you're unfamiliar with, it'll bring that up automatically so right. you don't have to leave the page. It's a great help to be able to make sure that what you, you're actually coding is and, being done pro and appropriately. And for that you're getting the right code in there. We have we had the book, now we do have the online mm -hmm, version of mm -hmm. that. My staff loves it, yeah. says it's very easy. And it is, yeah. and so that's a big help. Sure. What else, so the documentation, the informed consent, the, the proper coding, be aware that this could happen to any of mm -hmm. us. What, is there anything else that we should talk about? That, now, is there, where would we find out, out about the seminars that you give on this? Um, I listed on Dr. Blair's website, if you okay. go to the Practice, practice Booster website, as okay. far as the, the areas that I will be speaking in are there. Okay. Um, as far as, Another thing that I think is important for people to understand is the due diligence. One of the questions I was also asked is, um, you know, you had a person that was doing this, they were trained, but what did you do to make sure that it was being done correctly? Right. And my response was, well, other than training that individual, there was nothing else that I, I did. And so the question was, so if she was doing it incorrectly and didn't get the, the corrections necessary, she continued to do it the wrong way without any, any, any kind of correction in there. And I had to say yes. So my recommendation is to um, have either an independent individual come in, review once a year to compare what is being charted with what is being coded and what is being billed to make sure that it's appropriate. And therefore you can say we were so concerned about doing it right that we, we brought somebody in to do that. In, and if there are any corrections necessary, implement them. It doesn't have to be a professional that comes in if you have a relationship with a neighboring office share your coding person, have them go, okay, I'll send mine over, she'll do an audit for you if you'll let her come over and do an audit for me. Excellent. And that's a way of coming in and, and having a, 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 another eye on it so yeah. that uh, if one person may have a misinterpretation and use the code a little inappropriately, there's no a little inappropriately, right. then, the, uh, then you can kind of trade that information in both as a learning experience as well as helping that office. Makes a lot of sense, yeah. makes a lot of sense. I think we've covered about everything. Is there anything else? just before we close or did we handle it? The, the only thing I would add is, is to, there are a lot of arguments why coding, billing, and record keeping are unimportant or are not a focus of most offices, and it is, it's tedious. It's, it's not productive, but it is important. It's vitally important, and as we move forward in a world where Audits are happening more frequently, not just from the government, but from insurance companies, and malpractice becomes a huge issue. It's going to become more and more important that we pay attention to these tedious, smaller areas of the practice because they protect and defend. I can tell you from a person that suffered as a result of, I wished I had the opportunity to go back. I wished I'd had the opportunity to have someone sit in front of me and say, this is important and this is why. So if you ever are tempted to just shortcut, not do it the way you're supposed to. If you see this video, I hope you think of me and think of my family and the 19 months I spent away from them in federal prison and weigh for yourself, is it worth it to shortchange that part of your practice? I would think not. Roy, thank you so much for being with us. Pleasure, pleasure. Thank you.